Um, all right, let me let me talk to you a little bit um, about Benjamin on Kafka and give you a little bit of background and some um, some framing for this. Um, the two essays that you find in Illuminations. Um, um, one is published in 1934, and another briefer one is published in 38, um, the year before Benjamin died. And um, you probably know uh, broadly the circumstances of his death, um, that he was es escaping the Nazi occupation of France and got to the French border with Spain. Um, and uh, found that, <laughs> sure enough, the gate was closed. Very ironic thing. But despairing, he then um, committed suicide, even though, um, of course, the gate opened again the next day but without him knowing. So, so the gate and passing through the gate, you know, has a kind of meaning for the life. Um, and for the man, and um, and what's interesting to me, as you read through his letters in the 1930s, even up until the very end, he's arguing about Kafka. Okay, so one has to kind of ask a kind of general question, like why, why is it as the Nazis are taking over Europe and being, the Jews are being deported and Benjamin's fearing for his life, um, writing, uh, somewhat desperate letters to the New School in New York asking for a, um, a visa and getting very, very slow responses and from Dorno, barely any at all. Um, he's, he's arguing about Kafka a lot. Um, something's at stake there, historically. Um, and there's even a moment in, in a correspondence with Adorno where did you hear that they deported so and so? By the way, I read your Kafka essay, and then paragraphs on that, <laughs> right? Like the mention of the deportation, yeah. paragraphs on Kafka. Okay, or we could say displacement, or maybe a strange kind of lexicon through which to try to fathom the present, whatever that present might be. And we're already in a crisis of the present, right? We could see that. I think yesterday, in the thesis on the philosophy of history, the point was not. Uh, to reclaim an idea of progress for the present, but actually to um, uh, establish a revolutionary possibility in the present through remembrance. Um, now there's, I think, a set of debates about Benjamin, is he part of the Frankfurt School? Right? And most people who are teaching the Frankfurt School will teach some Benjamin. Um, but because he, um, wrote in several genres and um, was a literary scholar, also wrote books that have um, <coughs> uh, a, a fair amount of archival work in them, wrote on visual culture, on the work of art, on technology. Um, it's, it's not clear that he could be easily categorized as a philosopher. It could be that some of the work has philosophical significance or implications. Um, and he brought together um, several literary, religious, and philosophical traditions, including the Jewish Kabbalah, which I'll talk about a little bit, Marxist views on history, an immersion of Kant, um, mainly through the work of Hermann Cohen, that was the name I was looking for yesterday, the representative of the Marburg School who uh, wrote about reason, reason and religion, but also um, thought that there was a slow and progressive realization of reason in history. Uh, and it was against that view that he wrote uh, time and again, even though some of his own um, Kantian uh, speculations, including um, the very dense introduction to the, the German the German tragic drama book uh, uh, absorbs that Kantian material. He also um, was influenced by Nietzsche, uh, the tradition of German aesthetics, to be sure, but also was extremely interested in 
um, literary genres and literary eras. So the Baroque was what one of his very first books. Also, um, uh, German Romanticism was his second. He had two two theses that he tried to write. Um, anyway, you'll be glad to know that uh, his first thesis um, was rejected. Um, <laughs> So don't feel so bad if you have a hard time here. Uh, it was considered unreadable. Some of us are really pleased to join him in the in the in the club of the unreadable. <laughs> um, and uh, he had a very difficult time. He gave up the idea of, of actually getting an academic post and had to write independently and get contracts for his writing in order to sustain himself. Um, in any case, um, it seems to me um, that he was very often interrogating cultural and historical predicaments of his time, and he did so through readings of literary and aesthetic works, sometimes uh, urban landscapes, especially in the final books, um, uh, and, um, and also consumer um, practices, fashion, um, the smoking of hashish, uh, his own Berlin childhood, any number of things could be a topic for him. Um, but if I were to try to generalize or um, ask myself, what is, the, is there a kind of guiding question or guiding set of questions that we could find in Benjamin's work, I, I would say, uh, that it's the question of what time do we live in? What time is it? <laughs> what time is it? What time do we live in? Um, and um, is it possible within the time in which we live um, um, for there to be something like completed action um, uh, or, or satisfied life? Um, um, and um, I think he asked this question sometimes from a Marxist slant, highly influenced by Bertolt Brecht. Um, and when he did that, he was looking at the effects of depersonalization that an increasingly mechanized society exercises on human life. Um, and other times, it seems to me that he was articulating uh, or trying to, to make use of the resources of um, what's broadly called Jewish mysticism, but which is, in fact, a very specific strain of the Kabbalistic tradition, um, to think about um, ways of breaking with um, an historical time that seems to be uh, motoring toward um, uh, destruction. And um, so we might say, uh, what we might ask, what drew Benjamin to Kafka? Um, he reads Kafka not only as a great fiction writer, but as a purveyor of power, right? Um, and um, but also Kafka is one whose literary style is elliptical. That is to say, it does not uh, explain everything about what it is saying. It allows for there to be an enigmatic or cut or abbreviated quality to the language itself. And I think yesterday we looked a bit at, at that abbreviated cut uh, economic quality in the parable form. And I think you can see some of that mimetically reproduced in Benjamin's own writing. Um, I don't think Kafka is the only source for that. But Benjamin himself doesn't actually really lay out an argument in a systematic form. Right? Um, he doesn't start with a set of logical principles and then derive his theoretical conclusions from them. He approaches from one angle, he approaches from another angle. The object shifts depending on the angle from which he approaches, which is one reason um, I wanted to impress upon you the idea of the constellation, as or what he at one point called the monad, 
the monad, the kind of congealed uh, entity, uh, as as an important phenomenon for him. Um, uh, he um, he distrusted uh, and wrote against forms of rationalism that would seek to make logical and conceptual sense of an otherwise difficult world. He thought that the difficulty of that world had to be thought precisely through historical constellations that permit of various kinds of approaches. Um, and um, uh, and the, even the idea of illumination, which is so important to him, um, uh, is understood as um, uh, through the Kabbalistic idea of, of an emanation um, uh, uh, in, in the Kabbalistic work, for instance, of Isaac Luria, you have this idea of, of, a, of an original stuff out of which the world emerges. It's called Ein Sof, S-O-F. And there are angels, interestingly enough, Sefirot, excuse my, my bad Hebrew, um, uh, a, a angelic illuminations that, that, um, uh, that are dispersed from that original Ein Sof. And they are sparks of divinity, one might say, uh, that scatter throughout the world. Um, this view, this Kabbalistic view, is very, very important to Gersh Gershom Scholem. In the 1910s, he and Benjamin were in intense conversation about it. And Benjamin took some part of it, although quarreled with other parts. Um, and Scholem's own idea, for instance, of the Messianic changed over time and in some interesting ways that we can talk about, some of which are, became politically consequential. But for um, Benjamin, and interestingly enough for Kafka, uh, in the early teens, the study of the Kabbalah was extremely interesting. Um, and, um, and Benjamin certainly uses this idea of illumination or, um, uh, or divine spark, or what you saw, I think, yesterday in the theses on the philosophy his of histories, messianic chips, um, to, uh, to articulate the possibilities of revolutionary action. Right? What is it that flashes up from the past? <coughs> what is what illumination comes toward us from uh, a tower of ruin? Um, and it's it's not exactly uh, something one would call reason. It's not exactly something one would call intuition, but it is the apprehension of some kind of divinity or messianic dimension that emerges in, in the midst of a ruin or a, an image or a memory or a spatial configuration of history um, of one kind or another. Okay. It would be tempting to try to translate it into the idea of possibility, and I'm tempted to do that myself. Um, but it is, it is there as this, um, this idea of light uh, or of emanation, which he transposes into a revolutionary context. And I should just tell you that the transposition of the messianic into the revolutionary context drove Sholem mad. It also drove Adorno mad for a totally different reason. <laughs> Adorno didn't want that mysticism in the midst of dialectical materialism. Sholem didn't want his, his Kabbalah being mixed with, um, with revolutionary action that he understood as naive and um, excessively Brechtian. Right? Schoen was actually arguing with Benjamin's Brecht rather than his Adorno so much, um, but Adorno was clearly arguing with Benjamin's Schoen. Okay, I have a lot to say, but but be quick and I'll. So in terms of role, to be as quick as I can. Yeah. So in terms of uh, uh, Benjamin's relationship to say other, maybe not other Frankfurt thing, but the Frankfurt School. Uh, in terms of reason in history, like well, Habermas talks about the bifurcation of reason, or you get that in the dialectic of enlightenment, like the split, right? Like the, the sort of like a one moment in which uh, 
history sort of split against itself. Would you posit Benjamin somewhere in between, say, Scholem and the Frankfurt School? Well, let's be careful, because Habermas, you may know, um, has, in fact, uh, distinguished himself from the Frankfurt School and said very definitively that it erred on the side of aesthetics and that it could not furnish um, uh, uh, the legitimation for the normative conditions of social and political life. So, um, and although he has written on Benjamin, um, uh, 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 his main his main focus um, in separating his quasi transcendental move from the Frankfurt School was was Adorno, um, and um, but it is true that the progressive conceit continues in Habermas. Right, Habermas's main idea is that not his main idea. One of his central uh, uh, principles is that. Um, uh, the, the principles that govern modernity have not yet been fully realized and that our job politically is to help with the further articulation and further realization of those principles. So what Benjamin is actually doing in his critique of progress is actually saying the very universalization of principles that you think you need to further is um, precisely the means through which the revolutionary past, um, or the, the history of the oppressed and revolutionary action is being covered over. Okay. Oh, so it's okay. a much more radical break. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a much more radical break. Right. Yeah. Um, and it's not reason. Mm -hmm. right? It's not, and for that, and, and, for, and for Habermas, af, after very clear post-World War II, for him, any position that does not um, ground itself in rationality is irrationalist and therefore potentially complicit with forces yeah. like fascism or anarchism or um, nationalism. Right. So the bolt, the you know, reason it must stand as a bulwark against those nefarious kinds of forces. And unfortunately, that move. Um, ended up demeaning the entire aesthetic dimension of the Frankfurt School. Um, so Very the efforts to go back and recover that <laughs> have, have been, um, I think they're easier now in, in German um, scholarly work than they were 20 years ago, but certainly was a very, um, was, a, was a very big fight. But yes, another uh, question. Yeah, um, I just wanted to ask quickly, and maybe I'll get there, but this is the part of uh, Benjamin that I would like maybe a little more explanation on, is that it seems like this apprehension of the oppressed past in the form of like a crystallized image uh, of, you know, time being frozen, kind of. Um, the way you've described it is kind of like an intuition that overtakes us and we, we feel it and it takes place in maybe an imagistic form, and some of that we can see in Benjamin's writing with the Tower of Debris building up of catastrophe. How else can we access that image, I guess? Um, is it just always going to be something that's like intuition or that we feel and comes out? Or is there some way that this image gets um, conveyed to the rest of society so we yeah. can all be taken up in it? Or okay. uh, so let's remember, um, interestingly enough, in the Arcades Project, um, which is a great thing to read if you can. It's very heavy to carry, so for those of you who have it, you can't really download it, I don't think. It's really... I, you know, I always travel, oh, I think I'll, re I'll read, no, I guess not. That's <laughs> um, why I like parables. It's like, wow. <laughs> um, um, let's remember this. Uh, this strange illumination, which we may have all kinds of doubts about, but this strange illumination or flashing up, it comes to us through language and through objects. And in... Um, uh, in the arcades, it actually comes on the street and through the commodity. And tomorrow morning, I'm actually going to try to link for you Kafka 
uh, Benjamin and Adorno on the problem of, the, of commodity fetishism. Okay, because, and this will show you a kind of a, a split within Marxism that happens over Kafka. <laughs> um, um, and, and, and we'll read Cares of the Family Man, which is the, the short um, piece on Odra Deck. And we'll, we'll read a little bit about, um, uh, uh, from the correspondence of Adorno and Benjamin, where they're actually arguing about Baudelaire, but, they're, but they are arguing about the same problem, which is whether a certain kind of reified object, which has lost its human character, which seems to resemble a human character, which seems to actually be the epitome of commodity fetishism in the sense that this is a, a, a human subject that seems remade into an object. Um, uh, that, that there's still something that emerges from that, um, that less than human creature or that more or less objectified um, entity uh, that, um, that, that for Benjamin um, still holds that kind of revolutionary messianic spark and how 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 does that come through that's the question yeah. we have to ask it but it's not something we bring to it it's not subjectively constituted it's not it doesn't depend on our having a faculty of intuition it actually very much comes from the object world um, and and yet there is a certain kind of Agency in Benjamin, especially in the theses in philosophy of history, where he talks about the, what what the historical materialist does, right? He blasts, he opens, um, uh, he fights. Um, there's there is a a moment of struggle um, involved in the approach to the um, to the messianic or the response to the messianic. But it's not contemplative. It's not contemplative. It's it's actually in the form of action, um, which makes it interesting when you think about the Flaneur, for instance, his final work mm -hmm. on because if, you know is is he absorbing passively what happens on the street or is he walking? Is he walking? Is he in motion? Right? Is he part of the scene and implicated in it? Um, so. Um, no longer seminar, we could probably do that. So let me just say um, a couple of things. In, in the one essay, Benjamin begins with the story of Potemkin, you might remember, and then moves to a story about Kafka's father. Um, and what Benjamin um, emphasizes is the following that commonplace things have their weight, okay? Commonplace things have their weight. Um, the world that Kafka is describing is, is one in which human elements seem to be transformed into industrial elements. And it's not possible to tell them apart. And he um, offers a mode of description that allows this to become clear. So, for instance, um, when at one point, uh, Kafka, um, Benjamin cites clapping hands in Kafka um, and claims that the clapping hands um, in one of Kafka's passages are really steam hammers. <laughs> <laughs> Kafka does not say that the hands are like steam hammers. I mean, that would be one thing <coughs> if the hands were like steam hammers. Um, that would be to produce a simile, which maintains the difference between the two terms compared. Um, in the Kafka quotation, the hands are steam hammers, right? So it's an ontological transformation of the hands into steam hammers. And this leaves us, I think, with a very uncanny sense. The tone is familiar. It's even an everyday tone. The gesture in which the hands are clapping is surely not particularly noteworthy. It forms part of the background of everydayness. 
but for the hands, hands to be really steam hammers, I wonder if somebody can actually follow this clip on. I'm not going to be able to Page find it. Page 113. Great, thank you. Yeah, I was there, but I wasn't able to find it. Um, okay, yes, on many occasions, and often for strange reasons, Kafka's figures clap their hands. <laughs> Once the casual remark is made that these hands are really steam hammers. Okay, there we go. So, what I want to just say about this is that for the hands to be really steam hammers means that something has happened to those hands and that something has happened to the other day. A transformation at the ontological level has happened within the other day. Their noise, which forms part of the din of applause or another attention-getting device, has become <coughs> deafening. They've lost their organic function and status. There's a nascent sense that there might be a person somewhere who listens, the one for whom hands are really steam hammers and one for whom the organic human world has been really transformed um, through um, the figure of industrial weight, strength, and power. Okay, so on the one hand, from a kind of Marxist point of view, you could say, uh, this is the moment, you'll remember commodity fetishism in Marx, where he says, under capitalism, uh, objects assume human potency and power, and humans acquire um, the attributes of objects and that inversion is, is, is the, the substance of, of commodity fetishism which produces um, a personified object and a reified person. Right? Um, so here it seems to me, just in a kind of brief moment, we have an image in which a large and loud industrial instrument has taken the place um, of um, of a human hand, and um, and that that's that's a significant uh, kind of uh, replacement. So um, you know, at a at a at a superficial level, you could say that something living seems to have become lost, um, and yet uh, the hands still clap, right? So if the hands still clap something living lives on in a strangely mechanical way. There's a kind of uh, anim anima or living force that, that happens there that, that still is in the middle of that industrial clapping. And I think one of the things that Kafka does is get, get us to see this uh, strangely anachronistic and persistent anima as it enters into the uh, the process of what I've called reification, um, the reification of the human. Now, when Benjamin considers this, um, he he considers these these. Okay, we have to imagine it somehow. Clapping hands as steam hammers. <laughs> uh, it's actually a great figure because one can imagine a kind of Brechtian theater piece in which you know the audience is like. We're all steam hammers here. Uh, but um, the clapping hands is certainly a gesture. It's a bodily gesture. It matters that it's the, ha the hands that are at issue here. And on, I think, your page 121, he said, Benjamin claims what Kafka could see least of all was um, the gestus, G-E-S-T-U-S. Each gesture is an event, one might say, a drama in itself. Okay. So, what Kafka could see least of all was the gestus. Each gesture is an event, one might say, a drama in itself. So, on the one hand, um, Benjamin is claiming that Kafka gives us examples of this gesture. On the other hand, he seems to be saying that Kafka could not see this very well. 
I wonder why. Why is it that Kafka could not see it very well? It may be that Kafka didn't understand what he was articulating and that Benjamin comes along or Benjamin and Adorno come along together in order to articulate it more fully as a concept of the gesture. Um, now, um, there is a little essay by Adorno on Kafka, which you can find in his volume called Prisms, but I don't think I assigned that to you, which is fine. But it's just something you can put down as, as something that you might find interesting. Um, but there, uh, working with um, Benjamin's idea of the gesture, uh, Adorno writes that gestures are traces of experience covered over by signification. Gestures are the traces of experiences covered over by signification. Sorry. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. And so does. Um, also about that's Odradek, that's, that's correct. That's that's right. In very early work, stanzas. Yes. Could, could you repeat that just once more? Gestures are. Okay. So for Adorno, um, he claims that gestures are the traces of experiences covered over by signification. Okay. Now, if we think about that, that there are traces of experience covered over by signification, we might think again about how it is that the discourse of progress or the discourse of mankind progressing covers over, uh, seeks to cover over the history of the oppressed and produces its tower of debris, right? But um, Benjamin was also worried that there were forms of signification, including the discourse of progress, the progress of humankind, that cover over traces of experience. And what are, what are gestures? Gestures are the reanimation of what is covered over. They are those traces, in some sense, animated. Okay, over and against those modes of signification that would cover them over. Um, and in fact, gestures, uh, for both the Dorna and for Benjamin, become important concepts uh, for interrupting and exposing the smooth functioning of what Adorno calls signification and what Benjamin more precisely identified as the problem of progress, well, including the progress of reason, by the way. What does he mean just by the term cover up by signification? Covered over. Covered over. Covered over by signification. So does that mean they sort of fuse in a way, or does no, that? No, it means that there's a process of forgetting or of okay. plunging into okay. oblivion, gotcha. of rendering, of, of putting into oblivion or forgetfulness. So, <coughs> gestures. Then there's also reflexive qualities and gestures. Um, gestures are gestures cover over, but no, no. Also I'm sorry. Gestures reanimate. But that which is covered over by signification. Okay. They reanimate the traces of that which is covered over by signification. But isn't a gesture significatory in itself? Well, gestures aren't quite signification. Okay, all right, gotcha. Okay? Right. Gestures aren't quite signification. There's, there's something else. And, and let's, let's see where we, where we get. Um, Agamben's approach is then uh, related to Benjamin when he says something like, um, like the just, uh, people lost their gestures is like a, uh, to lose your gesture is yeah. to lose even the trace mm. <laughs> of what has been covered up. Yeah. It's a, even a more radical foreclosure, yeah. right? Like a gesture is still something animated from the past that is in the process of being covered over or was covered over and is breaking out. But if you lose your gesture, you actually lose the trace. Um, look, Agamben is extremely important here and he's covered this. Before, but the one thing that Agamben, I think, does not 
do, um, and he doesn't have to do everything, right, um, is um, to consider what the Kabbalistic background is, uh -huh. and also um, to think a, a little bit um, about ways in which atonement and remembrance function within the Jewish tradition. So I feel like he's, he can give you a lot here. And he's, of course, uh, quite, quite impressive in how he's worked with this material. But let's remember that I think they're, the domain of the Kabbalistic and <coughs> some of the, the Jewish ritual practices are not there. And I can sh tell you a little bit about what implications those have. The other person um, to read here is, um, is Samuel Weber, who um, <coughs> has this beautiful new book out on um, Benjamin's capabilities. And he's done some of the most important work on the concept of the gesture in Benjamin. So if you want to pursue this, that's, it's a terrific book. I believe it's Stanford University Press, the Meridian series, Benjamin's Capabilities. So um, Adorno actually has one idea of gesture, which he, which he borrows from Benjamin, and they, that there are some differences <coughs> between them. But for, let's just say what you need to know right here is that the bodily gesture emerges as a remnant or ruin of truth, a remnant or ruin of, a, um, of some truth that's been covered over or is in the process of being covered over. Um, and that it's extremely important that the gesture not be the same as language, because the gesture does not communicate in a propositional form. It doesn't give us actual content. It's an enigmatic remain, an animated and enigmatic remain, which is why it also belongs to the domain of drama and the domain of the event, rather than to the domain of language understood as communicative or as signifying. It's not a false <coughs> signification, right? The gesture, it's like something once meant something, <laughs> right? I'm, my steam hammer hands are clapping. This once meant something very different when my steam hammer hands were human hands and I was sitting in the opera in Vienna. Right? But what is left for us now, and remember we're interrogating the now time, we're interrogating what is possible now, how is experience structured now. What, is, what happens now is that the hands lift, clap, not like steam hammers, but they are really steam hammers, right? Which is not just a perceptual confusion on the part of a gifted novelist, but some kind of ontological transformation has taken place such that we can now say the hands are really steam hammers and they are decontextualized from whatever, there is no opera house, there is no performance. This once signified, it once signified, we were once able to locate it, contextualize it, understand its signification. It's the remnant of a signifying, of a signifying act and as the, the strangely animated remnant of a signifying act, it is a gesture, and not signification. Does this refer to like the macrophysics of experience or the microphysics of experience? Like, is this like there, it, it once meant something in my life, or it once no, meant something in history? No, it once meant something, something in history. historic. Yeah, that's what I thought. We're in an historical problem. I got confused because of the Vienna clapping. <laughs> well, Vienna and clapping, they're both very historical practices. Clapping in Vienna goes way back. People clap, they don't clap, they walk out, they stand, they clap a lot, they holler, bravo, right? They're, these are deep historical cultural <coughs> conventions. Yeah. Um, and, if it's, and if I use the example of the eye who claps, it's not that this is an eye who's not historical or who's not in the grip of conventions, right? And even this, I mean, where did I get this from? This comes from some other country. <laughs> than the one in which I was born, it's like, but it travels with me. Who knows where this comes from? Can you just, can you just imagine the difference between action and gesture? Yes, well we talked about action in terms of revolutionary action, right? And gestures can, can convey or emanate 
revolutionary potential for historical materialists who can act in relation to them. But a gesture is neither fully an action, nor is it fully a signification. It's a frozen action, you might say, or, or a, um, a stalled, in Stillstehl. Well, here's the question. Um, there's certain kinds of gestures, like if I, um, it seems like I'm going to um, kill a bug, right? You, you can see me ready, and you understand what the potential is, and you even see the end. But in the kinds of gestures we're talking about, this is happening in such a way that it's, we can't see where it comes from and we can't see where it goes. It's not as if there's a potential that is going to be realized. It's frozen and it's decontextualized and it's without apparent purpose or realization. But can't potential embody that? It's not necessarily going to be realized. Isn't that what potential actually means? It's well, possibly before you tell me to that, but it may not. What I want to say to you is that in this concept of the gesture, <clears throat> what the frozen gesture can convey is a lost world or a lost set of meanings or a reflection on, um, on, on Brecht, really. Um, he he furthers his, um, his discussion of, of gesture there, and it's in that um, context, I believe, um, on page 151 of your text, that he talks about actors being involved in, in the quotation of gestures. Right? So we think of quotation usually as something that happens through verbal discourse or written discourse, but what Benjamin insists is that um, quotation is actually something that happens at, a, at, at the level of bodily practice. So an actor quotes his own gesture on the stage. Okay. An actor is in a gesture, making a gesture, but is also in some sense quoting that gesture. And when that happens, when a gesture is quoted, we could say, if you can imagine the bodily equivalent of a gesture put in quotation marks, when that happens, the gesture loses its function in everyday life and becomes foregrounded as an isolated act whose signification is uncertain. Okay, so one thing that happens there, and this is part of um, Benjamin's interest in, in um, Brechtian theater, is that he does not want the gesture to be renormalized or domesticated within an existing social context. He doesn't want gesture to be explained by virtue of existing rituals and practices or uh, life worlds or um, uh, um, uh, language games in the Wittgensteinian sense. What he wants to do is um, understand the gesture as isolated from its traditional supports or losing its function within everyday life and becoming um, an explicit and, and emphatic event or drama. Um, so we have to remember, I think, that when a gesture is acted or spoken, it's not quite the same as a, as a full action. Um, it doesn't have the immediate instrumental value of an action. And a gesture that quotes an action has to be understood as an interruption of, uh, of action, right? A gesture is usually put into play in ordinary life in a particular life world or a particular language game for the purposes of accomplishing a certain kind of action. What happens in Kafka, and indeed what Benjamin would say what happens in Brecht as well to some degree, um, is, um, is that the immediate instrumental value of an action is um, uh, is suspended, is suspended, um, and what we get instead is a gesture that quotes an action, that quotes an action, and that functions as an interruption of that very action. Okay, so for Brecht, you'll know he, he wants to 
in some sense, stop everyday action from happening because everyday action is, for, is more or less complicit with the, um, uh, the operations of power, <coughs> power and exploitation. And you saw in Benjamin that moment where he calls on the messianic as a cessation of happening, right? As a standing still of happening. Um, and this is, of course, also um, a very important moment in Agamben um, when he reads a critique of violence and he talks about what it is to, uh, uh, to, 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 to bring to a halt the mach machinery of power, okay? It's something we find in Benjamin at the end of, um, of a critique of violence. But here, when he's talking about epic theater and gesture, which links his discussion of Kafka with Brecht, it seems clear, um, he writes, the more we interrupt someone in the act of acting, the more gestures result. The more we interrupt someone in the act of acting, the more gestures result, right? So interruption is a condition for the production of gesture. What could that possibly mean? Well, what it means is that um, the more we accept the flow or continuity or everydayness of daily gestures, can be gestures of compliance, gestures of subordination, gestures of everyday life that obscure the workings of power in one way or another, um, the fewer gestures emerge. But the more we're able to produce interruptions and break up the continuity of everyday life, then actions get distilled in time, they get stopped in time, they become gestures, we could say they're arrested actions, and they cease to be functional, right? We, we in some sense, uh, block the functional or instrumental possibilities of action. And that's what gestures do. They, they take an action, they stop it from being deployed in its usual instrumental way, and they bring it into relief as event or drama, um, uh, which also implicitly is a critique of instrumentality. Right? So we could ask the question, does the gesture act or does it fail to act? I think probably we need to understand the gesture, gesture as arrested action and as incomplete signification that calls our attention to what action usually is and therefore allows us to become critical of how it works and interruptive of its, of its uh, mechanical or progressive motion. Now, um, for Benjamin, the, the gesture is also to some degree shocking. It produces a shock, a jolt. Um, uh, and if you're interested in the problem of shock and jolt <laughs> in Benjamin, then you have to go read his essays on Baudelaire, because that's where he really lays it out. Um, but you can see that what he's looking for in theater, right, what he's looking for in Kafka, are shocking interruptions or intervals that work to um, um, stop the illusions of everyday life, um, that in some sense recall what has histories that have been covered over, um, and that um, that produce what he calls a critical reaction. Okay, so we could ask, how oh, is a critical reaction different from a revolutionary action? But I gather they're connected in some important way for him. When the gesture no longer functions seamlessly within what phenomenologists call a natural attitude or what Wittgensteinians might call a life world, um, or a, um, um, a, uh, a, a game of life, um, um, uh, then, um, the, then uh, we cease to take for granted contemporary ways of structuring time. Right? Time does not flow ceaselessly. Actions don't complete themselves in time. Uh, time itself is interrupted by incomplete actions and by, um, and by the proliferation of gestures. Um, and once a gesture is isolated or arrested, arrested, and once it is understood as quoting itself, which is very interesting, self-quotational, 
but that is to say it's it's not being it's not functioning or instrumentalizing, but it's calling attention to what its function and instrumentality has been and also perhaps what it covers over and what its and, and, and what its what its work is in the ordinary reproduction of power, um, then it seems that it can refer to the historical conditions from which it emerges in a different way. It doesn't embody them, it doesn't ratify them. Rather, it allows a critical distance on them. It doesn't <coughs> reproduce those conditions. Rather, it sets up a relation between arrested action or incomplete speech and those historical conditions that allow for a sense of shock or astonishment about how they function and what they do. In other words, functional or instrumental um, uh, actions are put out of play. They're, they're, they're unemployed, they become unemployed. <laughs> the gesture is the unemployed action, right? It's no longer doing its job. It's no longer reproducing historical conditions seamlessly. It's not working. And when it ceases to work, it produces a critical, a critical distance between the historical conditions it's supposed to be ratifying and reproducing and those well, that no longer um, serve as its support. In other words, gestures end up showing something. They borrow from theatricality, to be sure. Um, but instead of saying something that we can understand uh, independently or doing something, completing an action, um, they produce a critical function or a critical distance. Again, the question of how that's related to revolutionary action is still one. And this capacity for an arrested or punctuated form of showing is crucial to what Benjamin has called its critical function. Now, um, uh, the only other thing I want to to say about this um, is that Benjamin takes from this idea of gesture something really important um, for his own thinking. He, he says, for instance, on page 150, um, that the discovery of historical conditions takes, pl takes place through the interruption of happenings, okay, the cessation of happenings. In other words, we, it becomes possible to discover and understand historical conditions once they are no longer operating seamlessly, functionally, instrumentally, when they're interrupted or arrested. So it's through the interruption of happenings that this discovery of historical conditions takes place, and it also involves an alienation from those historical conditions. Now you can see here that there's a little tension between the idea of gesture he gets from Kafka and the idea of gesture he's pulling from Brecht. Because with Kafka, um, the, uh, there is this, um, this, this sense that the world that once functioned has fallen away and is no longer available to us. So there's a loss and a problem of remembrance. That becomes important for Benjamin when he talks about <coughs> revolutionary action as being bound up with remembrance and the, and the, the, the demand to uh, 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 lay hold of the history of the oppressed and to save it from oblivion. With Brecht, of course, it becomes different. There's a tactical um, effort made to wrench the gesture from its historical conditions, its everyday operations. And this active separation of the gesture from its historical conditions provides for the critical intervention. Okay. Um, so the Brechtian idea has a much more active mm, uh, directorial <laughs> uh, intervention at work. And with Kafka, something else is happening. But for Benjamin, drawing on both, he comes up with this very strong claim on 151, interruption is one of the fundamental devices of all structuring. 
Interruption is one of the fundamental devices of all structuring. It's a strong claim, and it's an enigmatic claim, um, but you can see that it has a certain anarchist potential, right? And Benjamin's own kind of affiliations with an anarchist point of view are also there toward the end of the critique of violence. Um, he actually refers explicitly to anarchism. But, but interruption is one of the fundamental devices of all structure. Phrases, expressions are repeated, quoted, and though they are derived from an ordinary sense of how things are, they turn the everyday into something astonishing, shocking, or jolting. And it's only through that dislocated sense of astonishment or shock within the everyday that something critical emerges. And this is one way that Kafka, insofar as he offers us a theater of gestures within his writing, is most clearly linked to Benjamin's version of critical theory. It's also a way in which the importance of truncated speech or incomplete phrases or incomplete gestures become essential to this critical function. In other words, if the action were to be completed or if the phrase were to, were to complete itself in a propositionally mm, uh, acceptable way, it would become functional, it would become instrumentalizable, and it would reproduce <coughs> the ordinary conditions of life when it's actually a critical distance on those ordinary conditions, which alone will allow for a kind of revolutionary action and, it, and the inception of a new calendar, right? The break with existing calendars, the break with existing historical regimes, and the, and the inception of a new calendar or a new time. Okay. So, um, the point is not to locate a quotation, bodily quotation, within a readily recognizable context, right? but rather to encounter quotation, citation, as precisely the interruption of a context, which would make quotation into a version of a strike. Right? It's like going on strike against the everyday. Um, now, kind of two final remarks on, on this issue. One has to do with what's the difference between theatricality and textuality? What does it mean to say that Kafka's writing is a theater of gestures? That's, that's a strange thing to say. Um, there are very important theatrical uh, moments in, in Kafka. There's a, the Oklahoma Theater um, a company in his novel America there are theatrical addresses. Um, there's the theatrical performance of Josephine or the Mouse Folk. So theater is very important for Kafka, and his own engagement with the Yiddish theater was extremely important, especially for his early writings. Um, and he drew, I think, quite um, easily and happily from that for many, for many writings. Um, but what I want to suggest to you is that at least in what is epic theater, Benjamin draws the analogy between a gesture and a text. And he writes a, a wonderful line, an actor must be able to space his gestures the way a typesetter produces spaced type. <laughs> okay? So an actor must be able to space his gestures the way a typesetter produces spaced type. But you can see that Benjamin is, in both instances, in the theatrical and in the textual, really interested in the problem of the interval in the space between that allows for a certain kind of interruption of continuity um, since it's continuous time and it's the continuity of progress and it's homogeneous empty time that relies on continuity that he's trying to break up in these various forms through descriptions, through textual moments, both of which could be understood as gestural. Um, and again, in Benjamin's thesis on the philosophy of history, we see very clearly that there's an interval between each thesis. Right? There's an interruption. If we wanted to make it into a systematic whole or a logical um, excursus that follows causally, sequentially, narratively, 
we would not be able to do it because it is broken up and it calls for, politically, textually, a breaking up of continuity and understands its critical function to be, um, to be constituted in that interruption, right? So the text itself interrupts its continuity at the same time that it's trying to make a kind of argument, I want to say a kind of argument, for that interruptive capacity. Okay, so what I would like to do, if we can do this, um, we can read together um, The Great Wall of China. I'm happy to do that, although we're going to be spending the afternoon reading um, Kafka with um, Avital and, um, uh, and, and, and Lawrence. Um, or I can talk to you more about the Messianic in Benjamin. Um, and you can be um, passive and grumpy students. <laughs> Messianic. Yeah, to the Messianic. <laughs> <laughs> Look at you. Yeah, not because you want to pass it because it's so intriguing. Really? Yeah. <laughs> what would you rather do? I'm happy to do anything. I've got my tea. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I have multiple happinesses here. Let's hear from some of the quiet people in the corner. Anyone? Mm -hmm. I have no preference. Okay. Are you doing okay over there? Yeah, oh. yeah. It's it's coming. It it takes time, but it, I, today is much better than yesterday. I must say. Even just the speaking at the beginning that you gave. I don't know. Does it help if I um, <laughs> if I go slowly and I repeat myself? Yeah, definitely. Okay. When we talk about this, the gesture and the image? Yes, yes. Okay, yes, tell me what you would like to talk about there. I mean, I do have some... Um, it's interesting. I mean, the gesture is a frozen image, right? It is a... It's a it's, and remember, we can't do this well here, but one of, the, one of the moves that Benjamin makes time and again is to take a temporal problem like history, and show how it becomes spatialized. Um, and he even has a discussion of melancholia in um, on the German tragic drama, the Trauerspiel book, where he talks about how, s how s a certain um, certain times from the past are only become available as landscape or as setting or as image. So what he's following time and again is how time gets congealed into imagistic form or panoramic form um, or as a, as a visual landscape of one kind or another. And that continues right into the, um, uh, um, uh, the, the, the late work um, uh, where he's talking about urban landscapes. At, at which point the critical question is how do these kinds of frozen histories emerge? Now the gesture is a kind of a frozen history, right? In a way, um, uh, a gesture comes from somewhere that somewhere is lost or, is, or the gesture is cut off from that history and then the history reemerges in some kind of animated partial trace form within the gesture. <laughs> So we have the idea of image, but we also have the idea of some kind of emanation or light coming through the image, which is why luminosity is, is a very important dimension of the visual, of the visual field for him. Um, now the dialectical image is a separate issue which relates to all of this. Um, but even there, by insisting that certain kinds of tensions um, can be discerned in configurations or spatial configurations. He's not looking for a logical way to overcome contradictions, even in capitalism. He's not in interested in a Hegelian mediation of opposition or contradiction. He's actually interested in coming up with an image that can hold intention um, um, 
uh, di divergent kinds of, 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 of moments of history. So for him, the image in some ways takes the place of dialectical resolution and, and rational reconciliation. It, it doesn't seek reconciliation, it seeks to find an, an adequate mode of presentation, which is very bleak for him, spatial, and, 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 and usually visual, but not always, not always. Um, In thinking of images and crystallization, um, and I'm not saying that they hit the same or but can you enter into dialogue uh, when Deleuze writes in Cinema 2 of the crystal image um, and the crystallization of time mm. uh, in film? Um, how, how would they enter into dialogue? Yeah, or? I don't know. It's a good I, question. I, I, I was thinking yes. yesterday in the bar. Yes, in the bar. We were, we were talking about, about the theater, uh, theater of the press. Yes. Yeah. Do you know? What yes. I well, and well, but I I will skip that part. And and we were talking also about the gestures on on cinema uh, for for actors because we were we, we were with Guy Garcia once here, mm -hmm. and and he was saying like, well now you know uh, in cinema you just uh, uh, you don't need to act. You know. It's just a director, the film director, that says you move from here to there, and then you watch in that direction. So I was, since you were speaking about uh, or uh, talking about this, I was thinking about Antonioni's films and, yes. and uh, this, the long sequence that there is a, in, in this this film, a reporter uh, Jack Nicholson. Oh. Yeah. Uh, the, the final part of the film is a long sequence, a sequence. With, with Jack Nicholson. Uh, with Jack Nicholson, yeah. So there, there is um, a landscape through a window, uh, and a lot of things happen with some other people walking. So th there are ge gestures in, uh, from people uh, anyway. And you understand what is happening without having this way of cutting in cinema, uh, because the gestures in, on cinema, when there are no sick long sequence, uh, the actors do something, and the gesture sometimes is interrupted. Uh, it is just the cutting and the montage <coughs> that makes like a kind of sense, but. Everything the interruption is not in the gesture itself. It's it's, it's, the, it's in the, the cut. cutting. It's in the yeah. Cut. Yeah, like in, yeah. Yeah. So in Antonioni's film, um, I, I was thinking about what you said that in gesture there is action that is not especially like a language. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. And, and I was trying to relate that to some kind of experience of how I see that from my point of view. Um, and I, w I was wondering, uh, so then how, how can we understand sometimes very well uh, working in a city, Ge gestures, People, I, I'm thinking particularly uh, when you go to a place that you don't know absolutely nothing. So then you cannot understand gestures because you don't know the history that is behind those gestures. Yes. I mean, when you catch the in the gesture, the, the space, uh, the history in a only crystallized moment. Mm -hmm. So when you understand very well the gestures, and I, I'm thinking particularly in, in Colombia or in some kind of moments where you really know for some kind of gestures that it is better not to be that there and it's better to move yeah. because there will be maybe, maybe something that will happen, but just it because little details on gestures on some people, how they 
euh, ont des regards, mm -hmm. ont des mm -hmm. fixes de... So I always thought that there were like a language with the body. And, and, mm -hmm. But now I'm understanding better this other perspective mm -hmm. of history. Mm -hmm. But I'm trying to I'm trying to relate this with media also. Well you image. should and you know for, for Benjamin too, I mean you have to remember that although he's working with literature and theater and thinking about Kafka and Brecht, he's also going to be talking about um, photography um, and to a certain extent cinema. Um, and, and this, and by the time he gets to um, the Passagenwerk, um, um, uh, the uh, our kind of Keynes project, sorry, in many languages, um, um, He's he's actually talking about the, the 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 visual cuts that happen within urban landscapes and even within um, uh, um, within with, within with um, landscape with landscape but also with reproducible images and iconicity that's technically um, reproducible so. You know, he's moving between modes of media presentation as he develops this idea. And in a way, I'm giving you the kind of rudiments, you know, literature, <coughs> theater, <laughs> but it actually does continue. And whether the term gesture continues to be the most important, it seems to me that, that Joel Schaff cut um, <coughs> uh, citationality, all of that. Continue, and the dialectical image um, continues, continues. Um, anyway, um, I guess I'd like to try to think a little bit about remembrance and image and see whether we can make a little more sense of these terms in the brief time that's left to us um, this morning. Um, so in, in the thesis on the philosophy of history, um, we saw that Benjamin makes reference to this idea of flashing up, which seems to involve um, the sudden emergence or breaking forth of another temporality um, into, um, into one, the present one, um, characterized by uniformity and progress. Um, that whatever flashes up um, uh, seems to appear suddenly and then to disappear. He writes, for instance, um, that the true picture of the past flits by. The past can be seized only as an image which flashes up at an instant, as, at, at the instant when it can be recognized and is never seen again. So it flashes up at the instant when it can be recognized and is never seen again. So it doesn't stay around. Hmm. Um, and later he says, to articulate the past historically does not mean, and I mentioned this to you yesterday, it doesn't mean to recognize it the way it really was. It means to seize hold of a memory as it flashes up at a moment of danger. Wie sie im Augenblick eine Gefahr aufblitzt. Okay. So on the one hand, it flashes up at an instant when it can be recognized, Anerkannt, and then here um, it, it, it can be, one has to seize hold of this memory as it flashes up at a moment of danger. Okay, so um, I don't know if we can seize hold of it, but I'm not sure we can keep it, right? Um, and we, we can think about what that seizing hold actually is or does. Um, now, something flashes up, but something also flashes through an historical continuum, understood as the historical progress of mankind. And this historical progress of mankind takes place against the background, as we've said several times now, um, of homogeneous and empty time. And sometimes it seems that this flashing up is something like an explosive device, as when he remarks that the awareness of the revolutionary classes at the moment of their action, 
um, is such that they are about to make the continuum of history explode. Right? So it seems to be a kind of politically insurrectionary explosion. Um, but this moment of action, um, which must be related to the seizing hold of the memory as it flashes up, this moment of action converts empty time into what he um, has called full time. And this experience seems to belong, um, interestingly enough, to the historian rather than to the activist. So one question we could have is whether the historical materialist as an historian also has to be a revolutionary actor or is implicitly a revolutionary actor or whether these are separate. Okay. And what is his, his point of view? Is, is separating the two? Or? Well, I, it I, it's, it's for me, it's an open question as I'm reading this. <coughs> um, I will be interested to know how, whether that question can be resolved. So the understanding of how the past continues to enter the present brings one into greater proximity with what he calls the time of the now, or jetzt Zeit. And this jetzt Zeit, the time of the now, is not just a simple present. It's not the punctual now, this moment, hardly. It is a sense of time, we might even say configuration of time, which he says is shot through with chips of messianic time. In other words, it would, it would this now time would be one in which uh, another temporality interrupts this one time and again. So it's shot through with messianic time. Now, who knows, being shot through with messianic time might also be kind of an explosive activity. The chips that have shot through present time are clearly supposed to interrupt its homogeneity. So here we see the interruptive function again. Something outside of homogeneous and empty time is then found lodged within its trajectory in parts and fragments and chips. So with, even within homogeneous and empty time, there are chips of what it seeks to foreclose or cast into oblivion. Um, and if the chips are messianic, um, and chips here can also be read as traces, then we're not going to find the messianic in the form of some human. Right? The messianic does not appear in human form. It will neither be an anthropomorphism, nor will it be a discrete event, like it happened in time. It happened on that day. Okay. Rather, the messianic will be something that's broken off, or shooting through, or broken off, having shot through, and now flashing up. <laughs> okay? it's, it's got to be understood. Um, as, as these bits and pieces of another time that have a way of flashing up or interrupting continuous homogeneous time. Okay, so the messianic is not a time to come that we can elaborate in beautiful, with beautiful images, nor is it really uh, a person or an individual or an anthropos of any kind. Um, it is to be found precisely in those chips and traces that flash up, interrupt, or shoot through. And in the 17th thesis, <clears throat> he tells us that the Messiah will not be understood as a redeemer, but rather as an antichrist. Okay, it's a very odd moment. He says, der Messiah kommt ja nicht nur aus der Erlöser, not only as the Redeemer, er kommt als der Überwinden des Antichrist. Okay, I'm sorry. So he comes as the overcoming of the Antichrist. Mm -hmm. okay. Big difference. Big difference. <laughs> but we don't quite know what's standing for Christ, for the Antichrist, uh, or who uh, the one is who will overcome the Antichrist. He does, I actually think he's, in a way, he's saying the Messiah is not Christ and the Messiah is not Nietzsche. Mm. 
<laughs> it's not Zarathustra, right? It's not the one who comes as the Antichrist, and it's not the one who comes as Christ. It's, it's rather, it's no one, if you'll yeah. permit me that indulgence, it's no anthropos, it's no human form. Okay. Um, and remember, of course, Benjamin's final line of these theses, every second of time was the straight gate through which the Messiah might enter. Every second of time was the straight gate through which the Messiah might enter. This is very important because we're going to be reading before the law this afternoon. Now, if every second of time understood as the Jetztzeit, now time, is, carries within it the potential for the Messiah to enter, might enter, then, then every second of time is shot through with the Messianic. Um, and interestingly enough, we have uh, an architectural figure, the straight gate, for the second of time, right? It's not a punctuated moment, it's already a figure, the straight gate. Um, which brings us back to my de destination, because you'll remember uh, that that writer, that, that master who's at least, mm, who's prepared or unprepared to go through the gate, doesn't actually go through the gate in the parable, we don't know whether he's going through the gate, the, parable ends with the possibility that he's going through the gate, something's going through the gate. Before the law, the man who comes to the law waits before the gate, seeing if he might pass through or if something might pass through, some light passes through toward him. There's a problem with that light there. Um, but here, um, Benjamin offers us, I think, a very Kafkan formulation suggesting that the messianic has to be understood as something of a wager. <laughs> the Messiah might enter. <laughs> the Messiah might enter. It's not er wird kommt, he will come when. It's rather, he might enter. He might enter. And um, it's not that a Messiah will come, true prediction, or has come, historical fact, but rather what we call the Messianic is always on the order of what might enter. <clears throat> and here again, I think we have a sense of, um, of what might enter a certain established temporal horizon. It's not quite shooting through or flashing up, but simply entering as one enters a gate or enters through a door, some opening onto another time. But what might enter through the door or the gate is not exactly a figure, not exactly a figure, it's a trace, it's a chip, uh, it's a light. Um, uh, it functions as a disruption to temporality or it functions as the, mm, as the, um, uh, the interruption of one temporality by another temporality. Right. The, end, the, the ending of one calendar in favor of another or the opening up of a different time from the one that has claimed to be time. Um, and it matters um, which of these interpretations we choose because on one reading, the Messianic puts an end to time and constitutes a cessation of happening. Right? Messianischen Stillstellung des Geschehens. But on another reading, some forgotten set of histories, though that which belongs to the history of the oppressed, flashes up and makes a sudden claim on revolutionary action in the present, which means that a past time comes up and interrupts a present time. And it matters whether our aim is to stop history as we know it, right, simply put an end to it, um, or and to go on strike against current temporal regime, refuse to act, or whether our task is actually remembrance, which is different, because that involves a reconstellation of present time in which a forgotten or foreclosed history of the oppressed may well enter through the gate, the door, and the memory that flashes up 
um, may be come the uh, occasion for revolutionary action. And it seems to me that these are two different images, they're two different ways of understanding mess the messianic, the cessation of happening as an end in itself, and the strike would be the, the paradigmatic moment for that, but then there's another which I think focuses on remembrance, the flashing up of memory, and how that becomes what is seized by revolutionary action. So is it, can, can you say that there are like two forces? Um, one is the, the one of the materialist uh, historian, which his action is also related to, has a messianic character with uh, uh, rapture in time. And the other is the um, those threads, those literary threads, that somehow invites the, the action of the materialist, materialistic historian, and, and somehow the, the fusion of those two, this it's like a, create like a temporal uh, event or possibility of, a, of an event. Well, it's possible, um, and it would be great to work that out if that's possible. And I think the most I can say right now, in a tentative way, is that. What we're, what we're coming up against is something of the more spiritual dimension of Benjamin, Benjamin, Benjamin's idea of the Messianic, which is involved in this problem of remembrance and the flashing up of memory. And then there's another one, which is more often than not identified as a, as a kind of Marxist, even anarchist position, which simply calls for the emergency break to be pulled on the machinery of the state or in the reproduction of power relations, right? So cessation of happening is the... It's actually the two figures. The these are the figures. So I'm not... Um, I'm not... the moment of... Uh, well, maybe they fuse, maybe they don't fuse. Maybe they're in tension with one another. Adorno says they're incompatible. Sholem says they're incompatible. I'm this is what's um, unique but, about Benjamin. But Benjamin, and they, they want to say they're incompatible for completely different reasons. Right. So it's, it's a wager, it's a risk, whether Benjamin can and does put them together in a way that makes sense. I think what I would say is that... Um, You know, one way of reading it is to say, oh look, the whole point is simply stop history as we know it, go and strike against the current temporal regime, don't act. <laughs> right? The cessation of acting is really important. The cessation of happening is really important. This is the, perhaps a gambling Well, it's, it is the part that Agamben uses when he talks about the strike. Okay. There's a second reading which involves the reconstellation of present time in which the forgotten or imperiled history of the oppressed may well enter into or through the straight, straight gate, and that memory emerges um, as exploding into the present and offering a practice of remembrance, which is also in some sense revolutionary, right? And we have to figure out if is that a different kind of revolutionary action than the pulling of the emergency break. Um, and, you know, I will give you an example of what, how I think this works. Um, I guess many of you know, and, um, well, for those of you who uh, either come from Israel or have lived there, you, you know, 1948, there is the Day of Independence and the day in which um, the State of Israel is, um, is celebrated in its foundation. And during that same time, there is... Um, uh, um, the Palestinian commemoration of the Nakba or the catastrophe, interestingly enough, which um, uh, seeks to commemorate the um, uh, the expulsion of 750,000 or more uh, Palestinians from their homes. There's debates about whether they were expelled or asked or solicited, but the Nakba understands it as expulsion. And the question is, um, can one actually have both histories 
being celebrated or commemorated on the same day or in one day after another. And several laws have been discussed and implemented saying that you can't commemorate the Nakba on the day that we're celebrating um, the founding of the State of Israel. Or you can do it, but you can't do it with public money. Or you can do it the day before, but it must cease precisely on this other day. And it's an interesting moment where like a good filmmaker, <laughs> a really good filmmaker, could take the two temporalities and see how, why, what is this interruption of one temporality by another. OK, well, the, the, the question is, you know, how does that, how, what's, what's the possibility of one temporality interrupting another and not being foreclosed by another? Like, what, what, and I would even say what possibilities of translation political translation, open up there. You know, Said, Edward Said said, look, in his beautiful book on Freud um, and uh, the non-European, he said, look, um, uh, the Jews and the Palestinians have two very different histories of displacement and exile. But why couldn't it be that precisely by bringing the histories of displacement and exile together, they would find some some way of understanding each other or some mode of translation between these two histories. It's right? the common, uncommon of uh, Nancy, perhaps. Well, maybe so, maybe so. Um, uh, so it's is, it's is possible. Is it related to the, to the politics of the culture and arrival that is going to arrive? Yes, maybe. 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 But yes. seeking the way to do so, it, it, is it the work of the, it, it's the work of the, Materialist historian. Well, it is a question, isn't it? And of course, we also know that the historians of that period are in huge political battles, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, who tells the story which way? Who's a revisionist? Who's a new historicist? Whose story can be told? Where's the Palestinian history? You know, all of this. But what I want, all I want, I don't want to actually get into that politics here um, because I'm in it all the time. Um, mm -hmm. I want to say simply this, that there are moments where pra the practice of remembrance flashes up and, and, and solicits or demands a reconfiguration of the now time, right? And what would a now time be in which the dominant idea of history progress um, is actually interrupted by the catastrophe that it seeks to foreclose in order to continue to tell its progressive story. And this became actually a very important point between Benjamin and Sholem, because Sholem, at least in the early days um, of his working on the Messianic tradition in Judaism, thought that the Messianic had to be understood as momentary fragmentary and couldn't become part of a history or narrative of progress. But then when certain forms of Zionism said, look, it's the fulfillment of a messianic mission to realize a Jewish homeland in Palestine, Sholem said, no, 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 no. The messianic is not about the realization of an idea in history. That can't be what it is. Um, and Benjamin was even more strongly querying how can that work. How can that work at all? Um, Sholem, later in life, did agree to um, accept the progressive history of the Messianic and wanted to um, ally it with law and reason over and against the right-wing Messianists <laughs> who he thought were more dangerous. Right. Um, so his, his view actually changed. But Benjamin continued to argue with Sholem using Kafka to suggest that the Messianic actually had to always be counter the idea of progress and realization and that it needed to be used um, more for the purposes of remembrance. And I think you can see that if remembrance involves um, an understanding of the history of the oppressed, it would lead to a very different understanding of Palestine and the emergence of the state of Israel. Um, Kafka, I wanted to tell you, has this great moment. You know, he goes to these Zionist meetings and he doesn't really know what to make of them. He, at one point, he says he, he feels like a 
a, cl a cl like a clothes hanger in the middle of the meetings. But he he actually says um, something quite important. He says that there was an alternative to Zionism, and it was the Kabbalah. He says it was the Kabbalah. He says that the messianic the messianic tradition from the Kabbalah is an alternative to Zionism because he was worried about uh, not only the progressive narrative but the state structure and, and the rest. Because the explosiveness of, explosiveness of the idea uh, of messianism as realization within history yes. is even much older than the political issue of the state of Israel. Oh, of course. It's like the chapter three. The Yes, it is. It's called a false messiah. Yeah. This is something that uh, always lurking behind the political. It's true. It's true. And I think that I think what's important for us to note is that the messianic can take progressive form. It can take anti-progressive form. It can take right-wing form, and it can take left-wing form. Mm -hmm. Okay, There's, nobody monopolizes the messianic here, mm -hmm. right? And even within Shalom, you know, his own. Move was, I think, quite astonishing, and it's why I, I you know, I'm so grateful for, to Agamben for making all of this available to us. But I believe that there's a history of the Messianic that doesn't get kind of fully, uh, fully investigated um, by by his his view, and I I wonder whether um, the remembrance version um, doesn't offer us something slightly different. So I'm just going to say this, um, which I hope will be interesting for you. Um, this idea of illumination I suggested to you has a history in Benjamin. There are all kinds of scattered angels and unredeemed histories throughout his work. And I just wanted to let you know um, about a couple of them for those of you who want to continue working in Benjamin. Um, um, and, uh, and and one one example actually um, I will talk about tomorrow morning is the figure of Odra Deck from Cares of a Family Man. And as you may know, Odra Deck is a wooden spool with a laugh that sounds like the rustling of leaves. He seems to have no fixed abode. Um, it's a set of remnants from another time. Um, and he's constantly falling down a set of stairs in what appears to be a family home, but is never quite stabilized in that way. Um, and in some ways, Odredek figures um, as the recurrent, the, the constant recurrence of another time within this time. So we might understand Odredek as a figure of remembrance. Um, and also, Odredek is said to flit by. Um, which is an interesting term, hushed, hushed forby, and that's what the messianic flash also does. The true picture of the past, hushed forby, flits by, um, and um, and um, One question, um, and, there's, and there's also a moment in his, his talking about um, his essay in translation, where he talks about uh, what what flashes up or what, what what lights up from one language into another, right? So it's not just that one temporality interrupts another temporality, but one language also interrupts another, and something of one language flashes up in the second language. So, is there a messianic moment in in translation? Um, now, um, when we talk about a revolutionary chance in the fight for the oppressed past, it's not just that we're trying to document that past or save it from oblivion. It's rather that if the oppressed past can be preserved or if it flashes up, it breaks apart a certain amnesiac surface of time, right? It breaks up the oblivion that belongs to present time, not yet's side, but the present time of, that tries to homogenize all time. And homogenization, the homogenization of time is something that Marx says is 
happens under capitalism. Right? Your labor time, my labor time become, become equivalent, exchangeable, they become homogenized. The value of time becomes homogenized precisely when it becomes exchange value. So there is this Marxist moment here when we're talking about the homogenization of time. Um, um, but it seems to me that Benjamin's remembrance um, uh, does something slightly different. Uh, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, reclaim the past in the name of the present or future. It doesn't try to reconstitute the past. It's not redemptive. Um, remembrance enacts a resistance to, um, to homogenization. Um, and if one recognizes or seizes hold of these moments, it's what one recognizes or seizes hold of is something called a chance, a chance for revolutionary action, or um, a wager, a wager. Right? So there's something about chance or wager which is part of what happens in revolutionary action. The revolutionary actor is not expressing the, the inexorable progress of history. Uh, the revolutionary actor is not representing the working class. The revolutionary actor is not pro in, propelled by historical forces that are understood to be deterministic. The historical, the revolutionary actor has to be on guard uh, to seize upon or recognize these chance moments um, in order to have the chance uh, at, at, at the, the, to take the risk of revolutionary action. And this idea of chance or risk or wager is very different from a progressive narrative or a deterministic one. Um, and um, we might say um, that the history of the oppressed might break through the history of the victor. Remember, he says that the history we get is the history of the victor. Um, uh, and call into question the claim to progress or even pull the brake um, on progress. Um, but it seems to me that there's also something else that's introduced here, which is the time of the wager or the temporality of chance, something may enter, something might happen, and it just, it's a strange sort of possibility that's lodged in history, right? So if there's revolutionary action, it's contingent. It's contingent. Uh, it's a risk, it's a wager. It doesn't follow from causality or from determinism, and it's not part of any inexorable progress. Um, um, there seems to be a chance that it can happen, and the messianic, if it can be recognized at all, seems not to be an event, it's not a happening, and it's not a person, it's not an individual, so neither event nor anthropos, but rather something like chance, or the sudden fragility um, of a dominant idea of time, or a dominant idea of the exposure of a sudden fragility in a dominant idea of time and progress, or an exploding of amnesia that seeks to deny the history of suffering and whose denial is a precondition of the continuation of history. Okay. Um, it's more of a negative uh, way of describing it. Um, I don't know if it's negative because let's remember that the interruption. Negative, not uh, in um, value, in the sense of value, but in the sense of the display. It, it's not positive. Um, um, but let me just say this. Definition, a negative definition. It's it's true. We can't give it a single positive definition. But maybe we could end on on this point that um, although sometimes it seems that pulling the brake on history mm -hmm. or causing the cessation of happening is the point of the messianic, which valorizes the strike and perhaps the anarchist strike in particular. Sometimes it seems that the remembrance of the history of the oppressed becomes a chance for revolutionary action. And what revolutionary action does is reconstellate time itself. We could say it starts a new calendar. <laughs> 
or we could mm. say it produces another uh, historical configuration of the now, so that the now is now a now time that no longer seeks to repress or foreclose the history of the oppressed, but is in fact permeated by it or um, characterized precisely by the flashing up of that history within its terms. And that what that does is produce a reconstellation. I don't want to call it exactly a Hegelian moment, right? Because it's not as if one is overcome for the other, but there's now a new time that emerges. So this is how one can get from Kafka through Benjamin to revolutionary action. We're done for this morning. Yes. <laughs> Sorry? It reconstellates a new time. Yes. What is that? How would we understand it? Yeah. Well, I guess the example I want to give, I, I, I would say two things, first of all. One would be the, dis, the, the disruption of that homogenizing of time that we understand as part of capitalism, but also part of ideas of progress. But it's also about allowing the remnants or traces of the history of the oppressed to be active or effective within the present. There almost is this negativity. It's, it's, it's activating some sort of negative, not negative, but negative energy that is activated by the oppressed. Well, it's lost or foreclosed, and then it, it, it reemerges in spectral form, right? So the, so its spectral or trace form becomes the chance for revolutionary action, but it also becomes uh, the disruption of the dominant idea of temporality and the possibility either of a new one or of a now time that is... Um, it's not just cognizant of the history of the oppressed, but that takes that history of the oppressed as part of its own action, right? That's able to transform in some way the, the, the nearly fully lost history of the oppressed, um, to take that as the chance or moment for its own revolutionary action. And that strikes me as a little different from the strike. It's about reconstellating time and, and exploding the terms of time in, a, in another way. I'm sorry I can't make it more specific. <laughs> it's, it's the best I can do under these circumstances. We're going to return to it tomorrow morning with Odell Ball.